Are you letting your thoughts limit your potential? Today's guest, Johanna Godinez, tells us how to use meditation to remove those barriers that you put on yourself and how to stop creating your own suffering. Johanna is the founder of Bay Lifestyles, and she also just won Mrs. Woman of Achievement USA. Congrats again, Johanna. What would the world look like if we all studied yoga and mindfulness in school? How does personal accountability set others up for success? And is discomfort a necessary part of the growth process? Johanna Otis and I dive into all this and much more in today's episode. Quick reminder to rate, review, and subscribe to the show wherever you're listening. You can also find the full videos of the show on our YouTube page. And if you learned something from Johanna, Otis, or me in our conversation, make sure to share the episode with someone else so they can learn it too. The best way to support our show is to share your favorite episodes with the rest of your tribe. This episode is brought to you by Tribe and Purpose. The transition from college to that first career is a difficult one, and it's even harder when you lose your sense of identity. If you're an athlete who just hung up the cleats, it's hard to go from being a rugby player to being Joe in accounting. We created Next is Best to help retired college athletes use their skills to create an impact through entrepreneurship. Next is Best by Know Your Tribe will help to smoothen that rough transition by helping you establish a clear sense of purpose, an actionable path to success, and the tools you need to manage your life. Your 20s are a confusing and chaotic time. Next is Best gives you the tools you need to make sense of the chaos and make this next chapter of your life the best one yet. You can learn more about Next is Best by Know Your Tribe at findyourpurpose.coach. Now here's Cam and Otis. Cam and Otis show on this episode, we are joined by the newly crowned woman of achievement for the U.S. Miss, 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 Miss. Uh, I was messing I am up doing too. well. Miss Johanna Godinez. Godinez. Hey, that was, that was pretty close. Did I get it right? Did I get her name right? Did I? Dang. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I failed Spanish. I grew up but doing Texas well and happy Spanish to be here. Uh, <laughs> it's just one of those things. Uh, yeah, well, it's great to have you, and I'm excited to, to dive into a, a, a few things that you've done because I'm super curious about them. Uh, I'm, I've always been fascinated by yoga, and I have a good friend of mine uh, uh, just up the road. I always point to her up there, Yvette, who's a, who's a yoga instructor. She always gives me a hard time. What what was it about yoga that, that drew you in? Because yeah. you started yoga as a, at a very young age. I mean, no, that's 16 not years typical, ago. I think 15 or something like that. It's not what your typical 15-year-old. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So that's not what your typical teenager or whatever starts off doing and going to <laughs> yoga studios because it's not disco dancing well, and all those sort um, of things so what was it that drew <laughs> you in well originally i got into it, to it <laughs> as most people do for the physical practice um i was a dancer and a gymnast when i was a kid so all mm. of those fun uh poses felt really amazing already in my body oh it's starting to rain here so i'm gonna have to move a little bit um but what what kept me coming back what, can you believe this i mean it is pouring and it is sunny out this is puerto rico for you um but uh what kept me going was <laughs> <laughs> Yes, By that's the what way, you can folks, hear in the background. Puerto Rico, um, no but you know, what kept me coming back was the fact that I learned <laughs> that yoga is how you control your mind. And I wasn't aware of what my thoughts were and who I was mm. in comparison to my thoughts. Um, as most people, I would let those conversations in my mind take over and make me feel a certain way and shift my emotions and shift my energetic state. And what I realized was that I am not my thoughts and I don't need to identify with my thoughts. So even though the physical practice got me there, it was really the mental aspect that kept me there and kept me coming back. Um, and it really took about five years for me to really understand what that even meant. So I, I went to my first yoga class in like 2006. And it wasn't until 2011 when I took my first yoga teacher training, not planning on being a teacher, just really wanting to learn more about it, um, that I realized like, oh my God, like yoga is so much more than just what's happening here with my body. Like yoga is a way for me to understand life as a whole. It's a way to live life. And um, it was in 2011 that I really, really changed uh, by then, I was a personal trainer. I used to be a fitness instructor, and I used to run corporate wellness programs. 
And that's when the wellness programs really shifted and it started being more focused on the mental aspect and the physical aspect because I realized that when people focus too much on their bodies, what happens is they obsess over them. So they get skinnier, now they want boobs. They get boobs, now they want the face done. Then they want the tummy tuck. Then they want, and it's never enough because the problem isn't your body, it's your image, it's your self-image, it's your self-confidence. And that's all up here. That has nothing to do with any changes that could happen mm -hmm. in your body. Um, so ever since 2011, it's, it's been a, a journey of really figuring out what is this practice and, and what is this lifestyle and, and how can I learn to actually operate from that space where my external circumstances are not defining the way that I'm showing up in the world. What, what I think is really interesting, you know, this reminds me a lot of something I do with, uh, with my clients. I always call it the, the mental fight of that internal dialogue of, you, you know, you talk about those thoughts coming into you not being those thoughts. And I, I always call it the mental fight because it's like somebody's coming and saying something to you on the street. It's like, you know, are you just going to sit there and let them, let them talk down to you or are you going to say something back? And, of course, when it's someone else, we always would say something back. But when it's us talking to ourselves, we let, them, we let that guy inside of our brain run our mouth, that gal inside our brain run our mouth. Uh, but what I think is interesting is you talked about the external circumstance there. Uh, what I want to kind of take us to is that next level past, because a lot of people, whether it's yoga or some other, some other practice uh, of meditation, that they go through and in that one setting, they can reach this point where they are, you know, disentangling those thoughts and, you know, working through things. Then we're taking it to a point where you're not doing yoga all the time and finding that kind of peace. Can you talk a little bit on that of taking the, the habit of this, you know, I can do this in this one setting, I can find peace, you know, whatever you want to call it. And then finding that to where it's like, okay, now I'm driving the car down the road and somebody cuts me off. I don't got time to get hit down dog real quick and yeah. pour your pose and get my breathing right. Like, well, I've let's calm down start right by kind of um, getting some of those switch? myths out of the way. So meditation is actually yoga. Yoga is not the physical practice. Meditation is the aim of, so yoga has eight steps. It starts with how you treat yourself, how you treat others, how you treat your body, how you control your breath, how much you can control your senses and the input that you're receiving by your senses, how much you can practice these things so that you can put them to play all the time, meditation, and samadhi. And samadhi is you understanding that you are not an individual. You're actually just a part of a life experience that's happening. And it's the whole universe unfolding, and you're just one part of the universe, not so much this, this identity. So it took the physical to help me connect enough with my body and my breath to understand how to harness the power of my breath in meditation. So I guess the practice that you do on the mat in like how you judge other people, how you judge yourself, how you deal with that end when you're in the middle of the practice, those are the things that kind of help you practice the things that you're gonna put to play when someone cuts you off in the middle of the road or when someone's rude to you. And again, it's that not identifying with what's happening. And that's the hardest part of it all, right? Because your mind has a thought, right? Something happened. Oh, that guy cut me off, right? Automatically, that thought comes into your mind. But it's that ability for you to take a breath instead of reacting right away that keeps your energy even regardless of the things that are going on. Because let's be honest, you don't know why that person cut you off. What if they just received the call that their kid just landed in the hospital and all they're trying to do is switch lanes as quickly as they can to get to an exit because they're freaking out because their kid's in the hospital. Like, you, you can't take things so personally. And that's really what yoga teaches you. It's that when someone does something rude, that's showing you who they are. It has nothing to do with you or who you are. But the second that you react and you stoop down to their level, now you're showing them that you're just the same as they are. So it's, it's, it's the physical practice just helps you do just that, practice. So that the things that you learn, you can start to apply to every single thing that you do in your life.
That, that's, that's great advice, too. I mean, I, I, I talk about that all the time. If you can do it over here, you, that means you can take that, that skill, because that's what it is. It's yep. a skill exactly. that you can do over here, and you can take it and apply it over here in this part of your life or this part of your life. You just have to make that choice. When you were doing yoga, I'm going to the athlete phase, you know, and you were, you were drawn to it for, you know, to help you as a dancer and a gymnast. When did, did you, well, first off, did you see improvement in your training? Oh, yeah. As a dancer now and a now it's just wow, coming down. You, are um, you know, by now. then I wasn't dancing anymore and I wasn't doing gymnastics anymore because I was a kid when I did all those things. So what I saw was my ability to come back to being able to do those things that I would do when I was young, which I hadn't done in a while. Like right now I'm working on doing a back walkover. Mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't done that since I was like six. So the fact that like at 40, I'm practicing that and starting to get that back into my body, like that's amazing. And another thing it does is, for example, um, in 2017, I was training to compete in American Ninja Warrior. I was at the strongest that I had ever been in my life. And one day I woke up and I couldn't close my right hand around anything, not even a pound. I couldn't pick up my phone, I couldn't pick up a bottle of water, nothing. So I went from the strongest that I have ever been in my life to the weakest that I had ever been in my life within one day, one day. I trained Monday and Tuesday I woke up and I couldn't lift anything up. And what yoga does is it helps you not freak out. Like it helps you go into a place of like, oh man, this is happening right now. I need to start adapting, what can I do? It also puts you in a place where when doctors would tell me that I would never do yoga again or that I would never um, walk on my hands or do monkey bars, it puts you in a place where you're like, yeah, that's your opinion. Don't throw that stuff on me. Like, your, your thinking that my body can't heal is, is you not being a good doctor. Because if you were a good doctor, you would understand the placebo effect. And the placebo effect means that people heal themselves because you're telling them that you're giving them something, yet they're healing without actually getting what you're giving them. Therefore, the mind is what heals, not medicine and not someone's opinion. So for me, it was one of those things where like, I literally had to be like, oh, well, if the doctors have these opinions, then the doctors are worthless to me. And I had to walk away from that and figure out, okay, so how do I deal with this myself? And I switched my training to the point where now five years later, even though my muscles are still not working properly and the nerves are still not all the way there, I can walk on my hands again. So if I would have listened to what he had said, I would have held myself back to the point where I probably wouldn't be able to lift my right arm right now. But because I didn't take his, his negativity and his opinion, because in my mind it's an opinion, as a fact, I was able to heal myself. And even though it's still not perfect, I'm still a work in progress, it's one of those things where if you know that your body is powerful and that your mind is what controls it then you can start to use that for you instead of against you we spend so much time being negative to ourselves in our mind and telling ourselves how terrible we are how we're not good enough for something i mean just switch that script and and make it work for you instead of against you and honestly the sky is the limit in terms of what a human can accomplish Uh, you know, you said, touched on something that is so true, and, and you know, we you hear it all the time. We are our own worst clinic, critic. There, if I can get the right words out, we are our own worst critic, right? We're most critical on ourselves. We accept. We look at other people that are doing the same thing we are, and they're like, "Wow, you're like, wow, they're so great. I suck." How do you? help people shift that flip the quarter over is what's going on in my mind that's quite literally what we got well the do. first thing is understanding that you cannot over. be you comparing yourself to anybody else mindset? because one of the things that we do is we oh i'm too old compared to that person or i don't have the education that that person has and the second you start comparing 
you are literally putting boxes and limits around you saying that if you don't have the same conditions that somebody else has, you can't make it happen. And that's just not true. Because we've seen people like Oprah Winfrey, for example, like she was raped as a kid. She went through a really tough childhood. She could have just been another statistic, but she didn't let that run her life. She didn't let that define who she was. And that's up to you to decide. No one can decide that for you. Like either you become the victim or you become the victor. But either way, that's all up to you. So it's the first thing is convincing them that they are enough with what they have as long as they believe that. The, if you don't believe that you're enough, then, then you're not. But it's not because you're not. It's because you don't think you are. And that's such a weird thing because people don't, un like, we're not taught that. We're not taught to think that way. So it takes a lot of kind of undoing some of those conditionings that, that we've been taught and, and the limits that we've been given and, and sort of rewiring our own mind to think differently. And, of course, the main thing about that is that takes time. Like, it's not just going to happen. Oh, we're going to talk three days in, on the phone and then you're going to be a brand new person. No, mm -hmm. it took me from 2011 to 2016 to really, really understand yoga. And it wasn't even yoga books that helped me. It was people like Earl Nightingale, Napoleon Hill, Ernest Holmes. And it was reading and, and listening to things that are thousands of years old. Knowledge even from the Bible. Not taking it as religion, but taking it as a metaphor for life. Just like the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. We have the knowledge out there. It's just that when we are convinced that one knowledge is right and another one is wrong, and we're not open-minded to what can this teach me, we, we, just, we put so many blocks on, our, on ourselves. I think the really interesting thing uh, when it comes to just the mindfulness and that, you know, that kind of uh, that kind of spiritual growth is the connection with the physical aspect. Uh, you know, what you were just yes. saying made me think of uh, Book of Five Rings. You talked about not committing to one school of thought. Yes. You have to commit to all the different schools of thought, because as soon as you commit to one, you're opening yourself up to weakness. And he did that through one on one combat, through sword fighting, and he became this expert there. You know, we talked about it through yoga. And I think there's this really interesting comparison. You know, you talk about uh, your physical condition. You know, I had a back injury. Dad, you've had back problems. The, we have these different limitations there. And I think there's this really interesting thing. What does every athlete do, Dad, when they retire? They all golf. Why do they golf? Because it is a way to put the competition into something, to take all of that energy and put it in somewhere. And you'll talk to people who are super into golf and they find it meditative, just like how for me it was finding yoga after my back injury of getting into that because it was the only way I could still go beat myself up. You know, that's the way I always viewed it with playing rugby, but it was, you know, when you're running, it's you're running till you don't want to run anymore and then you run five minutes more and then you run home. Like it's, it's a way of beating yourself up to reach that mental point. Uh, what I'm what I'm curi curious about is how do you separate those two? So you talked about going through your own personal growth of, if I got my math right, about 10 years to reach that point. Do you think that's basically a natural progression that you need the physical form of, like I said, beating yourself up for five years of pushing through the pain and pushing through those things to reach that? I think point? because the information isn't readily is available, that's just it. how we get presented with it. But I think it's a disservice to humanity to do it that way, because if I would have been taught these books and I would have mm. been presented this information earlier, I think at least six or seven years of that time could have been cut out because it took me joining a mastermind to learn who Napoleon Hill was. And it took me learning who Napoleon Hill was who, to learn who Earl Nightingale was. And it took me meeting Greg Reed, who is one of the Napoleon Hill Foundation um, authors, to meet his mentor, David Corbin, to walk into his library and find out who Ernest Holmes is by seeing a book and not getting my eyes off of it. And he was like, you can have it if you want. And being so if if all of that information would have been available to me before, I mean, Ernest Holmes legit like makes religion scientific. He can it, it is the most amazing book in the world. It's called Science of Mind. 
that book alone, well, first of all, it took me like a year and reading it 10 times to really get the book because it's so thick and deep with information. But if we could be presented mm -hmm. these concepts earlier in life, I think a lot of the growing pains that we go through, especially as teenagers and, and, and young adults, I think a lot of that would legit just disappear because we would have the tools to deal with these things that are happening in our minds. No, I, as a teenager, I was never taught that my mind is the one telling me that I'm not good enough, that, that a bully has nothing on me if I don't accept what he's saying as truth. Um, so yeah, I, I, I really think that, yes, because of the way that society is set up, we need to go through these growing pains. However, it takes us changing things a little bit and educating children a little bit differently, and we could change how every single person is manifesting in this experience. Because honestly, all of these things that are happening in terms of like people killing each other and, and God, on social media, you can't say one thing without 10 people having an opinion that's different and making you feel like you're wrong for your opinion. Like, all of those things are due to the fact that we are not taught who we are and, and how to manage our thoughts and, and that no one is right or wrong. No one. I don't care what you think. You're not always right and neither am I. And, and our ability to be able to be flexible in that way is what allow, it is what yoga gives you. Like people think yoga makes you flexible physically. Well, yeah, maybe, but not necessarily because if you're doing just meditation, that's yoga and you're not getting more flexible in your body, but you are in your mind, which is really where flexibility serves you the most. There's a, yeah, there's wanna, a thought I experiment that this brings to mind that yeah. I want to I want to ask this first before you go. Yeah. Uh, you know, when we when you talk about the, uh, you know, kids growing sure. up and learning these at a younger age, there's an there's a this is a big hairy one. So just throwing it out there. That's why it's a thought experiment. I don't expect a solid answer necessarily. But as we talk about that, it's a similar conversation that we had a few weeks ago on the podcast talking about mental health and, you know, uh, generations addressing the mental health issues and trying to solve things. But one of the underlying things that we come back to in that conversation, Dad, is the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And what I'm hearing with what you're saying, Joanna, is in flacker way to put it, skipping to that self-actualization. And if we're able to reach that point where we have that mindfulness and you can, you know, like, I think that all sounds great. I don't, I don't mean that, but what I, what I'm getting at is, are we skipping steps there? Like, and is there a, you know, we talk about the hierarchy of needs. Is there a natural need to have to fight for your food for a little while? You know, is there a natural need to have to go through those growing pains? If we, you know, skip to the last chapter of the book, is that, is that knowledge really the same strength? And that's, that's why I kind of want to throw out over to you, Joanna, of is that, uh, or I guess, what, how do you see that issue playing itself out if we are teaching the mindfulness? Because I see all the good of it, but there's this part of me that's like, do you, do you naturally need to struggle a little? Do you need to go through these things in order to truly understand it? Like, could you have that same perspective if you were mindful at 13? Or does, did that um, time... I set think you if up I would have learned this earlier, that, I would have taken advantage of a lot more things in life. And I, and I don't think... No, I, I, I don't because I, I feel like some people never get through the growing pains because they never come across the information. So they actually stay ignorant, basically, their whole entire existence. And that's a disservice to humanity. Like, just because you have this information doesn't mean that you don't suffer as a human and that you're not going to have growing pains as, as a human because we are still human. So, I mean, my mom passed away exactly a year ago and... I mean, I felt that. It wasn't like, oh, my mom passed away, but I'm a yogi, so life is good and everything's perfect. You know, I'm still human. I still had to really go through a grieving stage. And the difference is, though, that I wasn't identified as the griever. I didn't, I never became depressed. I was sad. I wasn't depressed. And that's the difference. You learn what your emotions mean and you learn what your thoughts do with your emotions. Because depression, it's already been proven that medication doesn't work without therapy. Okay, so then what's working, the medication or the therapy? Come on now. 
If it doesn't work without therapy, then the therapy is what works, not the medication. So it's one of those things where even if you have the knowledge, you still need to go through the growing pains to understand how to apply it. But not having the knowledge means that you're going to go through your entire life suffering and making others suffer unnecessarily. So that, that part of it, like having the knowledge, even if you don't understand how to apply it, having it in the yep. back of your mind means that as you're going through life experiences, it'll start to make sense versus when you're so like deeply hurt that like you're hitting rock bottom and now you're starting to look for something and it takes you years to get out of it. Like, I honestly feel like we don't have to go through some of those things. We don't. We don't. We do because we are not put the with we're not confronted with that information beforehand so it isn't until we go through these things that we start looking for other answers because we're like there's no way that this life is just this right but if we understand life at a deeper level ahead of time then we start to see our situations as this is why i'm growing this is why i'm learning and you start seeing the situations that you're confronted with a little different it doesn't mean that you're not going to have the situations it just means that you're going to be better equipped to deal with them and to understand what they're attempting to show you and teach you and, and that's that's so true i i also i agree that we gotta we gotta teach these things early on in life but there's also the philosophy that I've, I believe in, and that's the, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Mm -hmm. And yes, by providing those tools at a younger age, the probability of more people understanding it earlier is so strong. And, and you said something else that I think is, is, a, is a key point that I want to reemphasize is, you know, I can read all these books all over again. But until I take the knowledge that I gain from those books or until I take the lessons in those books and apply yeah. them and make them a knowledge because now I'm using them, it means nothing. I could spend all day listening to the greatest, the greatest leaders in the world, history, all those things. But until I take those lessons Agreed. and apply them to my life and make them lessons learned in my life, they mean nothing. And I think that 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 is the bridge of what we're talking about of, of teach them early. And when the student is ready, the teacher appears. It's the, you know, the book back here that I bought 25 years ago when, when uh, or damn, I got to add another decade, 35 years ago when I was in college, maybe that book. Yeah, because what, one thing. And One thing is understanding go, it intellectually, now and I another thing is being able to apply like it. But if we well. learn it intellectually earlier, then we're going to understand mm -hmm. as we're faced with situations how to apply it earlier yeah. as well. So we literally will have to suffer less altogether in life. And to be honest, like that's why I do what I do, because I think suffering, self-imposed suffering, is BS. Like I, I we go around hurting other people because we are hurting but a lot of the hurt that we have we are causing to ourselves therefore if you learn how to suffer less you will lessen the suffering of society as a collective and that's huge because it puts the responsibility on us not on god not on your teachers not on your boss not on your spouse not on your kids on you it's your responsibility to learn who you are and to start taking those steps. And I think that learning that earlier would serve society as a whole because too often we're, and especially now, we are raising victims of this world. And unfortunately, victims suffer and they cause suffering. Whereas the second you understand that you own your life experience and you are manifesting it, whether you understand it or not, that's really going to serve especially people that feel very lonely and lost or who who grew up in a religion that made them feel like they weren't good enough or, or like they had to fear a lot of things like it's going to make people just <laughs> oh. <laughs> there's a few of them i mean right, jehovah's witnesses christians like and and, and it's terrible because <laughs> the the problem is 
Nowhere in yoga oh, yeah. does yeah, it say yeah. that God doesn't exist. What it does say is that you are a part of God. You are a part of the experience. God isn't outside of you. So you asking for something as if you don't have it to some entity that doesn't quite exist the way that you think of, it's a disservice because you're literally manifesting staying in an unfavorable place because of the way that you're asking for things. When you're asking as, I really want this, I don't have it, I think you can give it to me, please, I really need this. The universe doesn't get that. The universe is like, oh, that's what you're thinking about. So I'm going to keep you there because that's all you see. So since you're seeing your unfavorable circumstance over and over in your mind, you remain in the unfavorable circumstance because the universe doesn't understand your words. It understands your energy and your vision. And if your vision is in what you don't want, you are literally manifesting what you don't want. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Cam and Otis Show. If you're enjoying this conversation, then make sure to share it with other lifelong learners in your life so they can enjoy it too. Stay up to date with the show on Facebook and Instagram at Cam and Otis Show and subscribe to our channel on YouTube so you're the first to hear about new episodes and other special content. Now let's get back to the show. Mm -hmm. So how, do you, how did you take this? Well, let me, I don't want to... I was trying to decide which way I wanted to go because go I love this discussion and I know that the, <laughs> the three of us can continue to dive into this all day. But but I wanna I wanna grab some business stuff here. I know. Otis ruins the fun again. That's you know, that's the dad job, right? Uh, you you fell in love with this yoga and you felt this inner peace from it. What and, and, and here's where I was thinking. Was it an intrinsic or extrinsic catalyst that caused you to start a business that uses these skills, the yoga principles, and create those those? Um, uh, well, it didn't. Oh shoot! I had left my purse others. out here, so my How purse did, is where now. Where did that come mess. from? Okay. Um, Sorry. Uh. Um, really, uh, um, so can you can you do me a favor? Can you grab my purse? I Where'd left it out here when it was raining. Um, so I guess I guess it took me going through certain things to to turn my business into that because I started through the external body. Like when I first did um, shoot. when I was first doing um, wellness programs, for they were all based on physical. It was all getting them healthier so that um, uh, their workplace, so that they had less days off, so that they were happier people at work, so that they were healthier altogether. So the focus was external. Once I understood the yoga philosophy and what that meant, I was like, oh my God, like I am perpetuating the problem because I am becoming a doctor. I am looking at your symptoms and treating your symptoms and I'm not asking why that happened, right? So if I'm just looking at your body, and you are, I, I had a client who at 23 was 420 pounds. So if I'm just looking at your body, you're 420 pounds. We have to work on strength. We have to work on mobility. And we have to work on getting the, the weight down. Okay, but if I don't ask you why you got to 420 pounds in the first place, then I'm not getting to the root cause of the issue. So me doing all these things to help him lose weight, if I don't deal with his mentality and the way that he sees food or the way that he sees himself, I'm not actually helping them whatsoever. I'm actually perpetuating the condition. So what happened is in 2008, I started my, my corporate wellness programs. In 2011, I took teacher training. So in 2012, everything changed because that's when I started realizing like, okay, we need to start figuring out the inner part connecting that to the outer part, and then seeing how people operate as individuals. Because there is no recipe for everyone. Like yes, as people, we definitely need um, to have a healthy body, to have a healthy mind, and we all kind of need the same thing to survive. But because our psychology is so unique and we can use our minds the ways other animals cannot, that means that we need to be looked as individuals when we're dealing with these conditions for ourselves. So I guess it started intrinsically, but then very much quickly it became an ex external thing because I was like, man, 
I am a completely different person. I used to cause so much suffering to myself. And like, it's a disservice to society if I don't use all these things that help me become free of my, me my own mental suffering. Not that I'm free 100%, right? I'm still human, but like, at least I understand it, it to another level. Um, I just figured it would be a disservice to humanity if I didn't elevate it into everything. And to be honest, I'm a firm believer that this experience of life is guiding us. Like we we think that we are in complete control and that's fine. I mean, it, it, like we need to feel like we have an illusion of self-control, but for example, so when that thing happened to my arm, I was teaching 23 fitness classes and I dropped it down to six. Well, with six, I couldn't live. I couldn't make a living, right? Yeah. So, so I, I had to find something else. I started modeling for a living. Yeah. I pulled it out of my bottom and somehow I'm five feet tall and somehow managed modeling for a living. And while I was doing that, I was in North Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I got a call from someone in California that they invited me to their wedding. Very, very and high heels. When I was shoes, there, right? I told her everything that was going on. She's like, come work for me for the Bay Clubs in California. <laughs> so I moved to California and I actually started my yoga program for the Bay Clubs. That's why it's called Bay Lifestyle. But when COVID came, they gifted it to me and fired me along with it. So did I choose to go to California? No, something presented itself. Did I choose to make the yoga school? No, I got hired to do it. So somehow that yoga school had to be something that I was doing. And the universe didn't know how to get me to do it other than putting all of these other things into play, getting me to get hurt, getting me to be doing weird things for work, getting someone to get divorced and remarried so that I could be invited to the re-wedding and then find myself in California. Like I didn't, I didn't create those scenarios. Those scenarios presented themselves. So a lot of times we get stuck in, in, the, in our comfort zone and in not wanting to branch out and we don't take opportunities and we suffer a lot through that as well because we're not flowing with the universe and we're not flowing with the things that are presenting themselves, um, which is exactly why I just did this pageant. Like, I am not a pageant girl, okay? I used to race cars. My first business was a racing school. I, I like having my nails dirty. I don't do my nails. I don't do makeup unless I have to. Like, <laughs> why would anyone think that I belong in a pageant? I don't know, but something is going to come out of this because the fact that I won means that people are ready to be looking at something that's more than just beauty. People are ready for a message that's going to help them understand who they are and how to operate better. And it took winning a pageant now for me to be here in Puerto Rico and have the ability to go on the news and to spread this message down here where it's needed very, very much because people are very close-minded down here. So it, it's, it's, yes, it's intrinsic, right? Because you're the one making the choice as to what you're doing and what you're not doing. But in the end, if anything serves you and you don't share it, you're hoarding. And the universe doesn't like hoarding. The universe likes sharing. It really feels good in the sharing space. So it's just another way for us to actually be like doing what by nature we're meant to do, which is support each other. I mean, we, we're, we're humans are tribesmen. We're tribes people. We're not meant to be alone. We're, we're meant to help each other. We're meant to see what you're good at and what I'm good at and how we can put it together and make things even better. Oh, 100%. Yeah, you, you nailed, you, yes. you hit the nail on the head with that one because if we, you know, I mean, why do we call ourselves our, our business driving purpose, right? We believe in that aspect of the human nature to be part of something bigger than yourself it is so critical to to feeling that and going back to the maslow's hierarchy and needs and i also want to touch on the, the the stepping out of the comfort zone 
Uh, you know, I'll give a shout out to uh, Michael Easter. I'm about eh, about halfway through his book, uh, The Comfort Crisis, and what Camden was talking about skipping levels, and what you just mentioned in that getting comfortable, and what his book talks about is how now that the first two levels of Maslow's hierarchy or needs is given to us, how do we sustain Uncle. ourselves in growth and doing things that put us into a discomfortable, that's a weird word to <laughs> I say, love it. discomfortable and uncomfortable. There we go. There we go. There we go. An uncomfortable situation. Yeah, my Texas education comes out <laughs> all the time. Uh, but an uncomfortable situation because there's growth in the discomfort. So I can say discomfort here, but not there. So there's growth in the discomfort of this. And that's a powerful thing to do. In the Misery, you know, we used to say in the army, misery loves company. Yeah. And when it's yeah, sucks, it, it is, when it isn't in bad suck, when we drag them down with us, though. That's, a tribe that's mate the difference. Sitting and, next to and you that's, when yeah. you're in the suck. I think, can I, I want to add something. I, yeah. Yeah. Oh. And I think that, that's, that's a huge difference. I think one interesting you know. thing there, you know, talking about discomfort and, you know, like we said, skipping the steps of the hierarchy of needs. I think there's the interesting thing there where, as we've talked through this, the discomfort, like, like I, I think I said it jokingly of it's like, so does everyone need to like struggle for food for a year? Like, is that how you get reach self action? But it's, and we all kind of like shook our heads like, no, but I think the interesting thing there is that it's, it's the discomfort itself. I don't think it has to be a specific type of discomfort. I think if you go through and you are in a, you know, upper class family and you live your whole life and then there's a family death and it shakes you to your core and you learn from that discomfort and that's what brings you to that mindfulness, just like somebody who's yeah. struggling to put food on the table can reach that point of mindfulness through their struggle, through that different discomfort. I think that's an important thing there because it's the discomfort can be kind of universal in that sense. And I think that's that's where that growth comes from. And I think the important thing there is that is, again, a choice. Yeah of if you are in the discomfort, it, whatever that is, you can choose to see that as the opportunity for mm. growth rather than being like, oh, yes. well, you know, I grew up with this background and so I don't get the opportunity to become who I am. You know, uh, Viktor Frankl, uh, I, what's the phrase? Uh, Viktor Frankl says like, I pity the man who does not have the opportunity to prove himself or something mm. like that. Pity the man makes it sound like Mr. T. But <laughs> that you, <laughs> I pity the that if you, you think you don't have the opportunity to prove yeah. yourself, but uh, kind of to your point, Joanna, that the life is discomfort. You're yeah, find and, that discomfort and one thing that you another. mentioned as it's well, like, okay, so to make do I have to go through the discomfort or what if you go through the discomfort and I learn from you? Like that's part of the benefit of being tribe. It means that I don't have to go through all of it alone. I can learn from other people. And that's what we're learning now, too. It's like when people... There's a, there's a type of personality, let's call it that way, that really does need to hit rock bottom, that they cannot learn based on somebody else's issues. But there's others that can, they, that they can. They can. They can observe and they can see what someone's going through and how they got out of it and apply that into their own lives versus other people need to get knocked and knocked and knocked and knocked and knocked until finally they're like, okay, I can't get knocked down anymore because everything is broken. And then they come out victorious. So it really it depends on the person in that sense. But the fact that we live in community and we have the ability to learn from each other, again, it's a disservice if we're not using that. Because in the yeah. end, if you think about it, most of what humans do is learn from other people. So why is it that we can learn in school and we can be taught math and science and, and whatever else in school, but yet we can't learn how to be better people or how to not do bad things to our bodies based on other people. It's because we're not being taught how. Um, so yeah, I, and, and by the way, Viktor Frankl, like I have, I make all of my students read that book before they and take I teacher think training. The other, the other piece to that. They have to. Uh -huh. I think mm. uh, what you're saying there ties Very back important. so much to what you said, Dad, of the, uh, of the, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher will present themselves, you know, the right advice from the right person at the right time. Uh, you know, I was, I was 
thinking back to if I was freshman in high school and I was taught mindfulness in a class, I probably wouldn't have learned it just like I didn't learn social sciences that year. Like if I learn it, you know, it's, and it's, but it's that type of a thing. Each person's different. And I think we, we get too focused on those edges of the bell curve exactly. uh, rather than the entire group, which is you should be teaching it, give them as many opportunities to learn as possible. Just like with, you know, nutrition or any other thing that, you know, people struggle with. If they're not going to learn it in school, then they need to learn it elsewhere. And that's, you know, whether it's from a podcast or from a YouTuber or whatever it is, you got to present as Yeah, and as think many about it. Like, we all run around with a body and a mind, so yet we have no idea how to ready, feed our body and no idea what our mind does. Like, how ridiculous is that? Like, come on, you're teaching me social studies and geography and geology. Like, I'm not using any of that right now. I'm a yoga teacher. Oh, but I eat every day and I need to move my body if I want to stay healthy. So how, are, how come you're spending all this time teaching me things that are useless to my mind, yet you're not even teaching me how to take care of my own self? I mean, it's just the way things are set up right now are, is pretty, pretty messed up because the focus is so much on the monetary and the external and not enough on the internal. And the fact of the matter is, like, right now we're literally paying for our health. We're not, we're not naturally being healthy. We're literally having to pay for our health because we don't understand our bodies. Mm -hmm. So it's like we get ill and then we go to the doctor and then we're taking all these medicines. So we're paying to stay healthy when all it takes is just eating and, and being in moderation. It doesn't even mean don't ever drink, don't ever smoke, don't ever do anything. There, it doesn't need to be a don't like ever or, or, or a never kind of thing. But if you do anything and everything in moderation, and you understand how you operate as a person. If something doesn't make you feel good, don't do it. Like, but nope, we want to do it. We want to do it. We want to do it because other people are doing it. Doesn't matter how it feels to us. Other people are doing it. We're doing it too. So we're, we're, we're using all of these things that are like presented to us, but not in a way in which we're being, what's the word? like self-autonomous and, and really caring for ourselves and, and thinking about how this is affecting us and how we're affecting others based on it. And I think that that's, that all comes with what we're taught in school. We're just not taught enough about what it means to be a human and what it, all of it, holistically, from top to bottom, what it means to be a human. And maybe I take a nutrition class and I don't hear it, but... You're, the knowledge is still there. You may not be operating. You may still be eating the chips, but you still know. And the difference is that knowledge is power and ignorance is not bliss. Mm -hmm. Like people may think mm -hmm. it's bliss and that's bullshit. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is just ignorance and it leads to suffering and it leads to more ignorance. So, yeah, it, it's it's. It doesn't matter if, if at ninth grade you learn it and you don't apply it. What matters is that you learned it. And what matters is that that knowledge is in the back of your mind. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely think that there's things that we can do to at least set humans up to be more healthy in body and especially in mind. I'm going to take a leap, just guessing on the little bit that, that uh, I know you. What's the solution and what's your yes. vision of change? Because I agree yes. with you 100%. And I'd add in there uh, a couple other things like budget, balancing your checkbook, how do you take care of your money, and the, the subject that I freaking hated having to take as a, uh, as a master's program 10 years after graduating college. Yeah going back and taking basic probability and statistics. That also is a huge thing, understanding why I didn't win the lotto of, what is it, $4 billion or something ridiculous. Well, obviously number. yoga. You know, in in, that <laughs> in, sense. My, so in, in my mind, yoga. What, what is the vision <laughs> Yoga, Yoga is the answer. I mean, you when you look at the, the eight change. limbs of yoga, the eight limbs of yoga <laughs> teach you how to treat other people, yoga for everybody. how to treat yourself, <laughs> how to take care of your body, how to take care of your mind, what your senses do and what they do to your mind, how to harness your senses and focus. And then it teaches you that you're not as human as you think you are. Like, like if I hurt you, I'm hurting myself. We're not taught that. We're not taught how the suffering that we cause on others comes back. And it's not karma in the way that like, I, 
it's like what comes back to me. Karma just means every thought, word, and action that you put out will have a consequence. And it's not based on what you get back. It's based on what you did. It's based on your action. So it isn't about the reaction. It's about the action. And we're, again, we're not taught that. We're not taught about the power of our thoughts and our words. So we spew them out without thinking about it twice and then have to deal with the consequences of those things that we do because we don't think about it ahead of time. We don't take that pause, right? Pranayama is breath. That's number the fourth limb. Your breath is a huge tool to allow you a pause. Is this what I want to say? My emotions are really riled up. Let me take a few deep breaths. I need to calm down before I answer this question. That kind of thing. But again, we're not taught any of that. So it takes you saying the wrong thing and suffering based on your actions and thoughts and words to be able to be like, hmm, maybe I should think before I answer. Okay, but you can be taught to think before you answer. You don't need to go through all this pain to be able to learn it. So definitely a version of yoga. It doesn't need to be the yoga sutras and it doesn't because yoga is not a religion. A lot of people think it is, but yoga is a path back to who you are. And who you are serves you no matter what you believe. Um, so yoga can be practiced with any religion. It's found in Hindu books because they understood the power of the practice in, in creating better individuals. So they wanted to be yogis, but it wasn't a part of their religion and just made them better at their religion or if that makes sense. Yeah, just like you, Dad, you asked the question earlier about you know applying the yoga to your uh, to, to your athletic abilities and those type of things. So I know that's something I got out of it a lot when I was playing rugby. But then also, like you're saying, Joanna, of applying it to those other aspects. And I think what's really interesting, the the one thing I would add there is, and I think, and I don't even know who said this. But I think it's a Buddhist phrase, but uh, I'm butchering it, so it doesn't really matter too much anyway. <laughs> but it's you know you you find your way, you find your path forward, you find your way how to live life and how you're comfortable with it, and then once you learn, you can go back and then teach others to follow that way. Uh, because what I, what I'm hearing a lot when you talk about yoga is it's the same way uh, I talk about rugby. Because that's where I got so many of my life lessons about hard work, about discipline, about taking care of others and all these different things. You know, I could talk all day about that. And that's why I chose to get back through the sport that way is to create that path for other people to get in. I think that's yeah. a really key point of whatever your path is. If you find that path of being able to then work to show it to others, because you we all have to heal ourselves in that way, like you were saying. Of It's all internal when it comes down to it. And yeah. once you conquer yourself internally, then you can go and try to help others with that. But then it's still an internal battle. I think that's a really key piece there. Of You can present people with the opportunities to learn, but they have to do the learning. They have to really understand it. Uh, but th I think that's the key piece there, is it's each individual has an opportunity to, one, find your own path, two, give that path to others, or three, follow someone else yeah. on their path. Because, you know, if somebody was teaching me this, and I, I mean, shoot, yeah. I'm following someone else on rugby. I didn't make this up. I didn't invent the sport. Someone else taught me these things. That's what drew, drove me to it and i think that's the key piece there of being able Agreed, to 100%. take that like, ownership it, it's of it through and then after you take that ownership then turning like, back and giving it back to your example that, that that you inspire others it's not it's not just the words it's like and people always ask me why are you so happy well i mean i'm telling you that i'm not suffering mm -hmm. in my mind why wouldn't i be happy like i'm i'm, I'm living <laughs> i'm living a happier life because i'm applying the things that that i've learned you know and it's it's one of those things like that's why i inspire people because they want to find that joy within themselves you know so it's yeah and it's beautiful and, and you're right any any path does mm -hmm. and when we talk and when you talk about solving yeah and when you talk about solving the big problems and especially you know when it's comes back to the internal aspect it's like okay well i figured out how to be happy how do i teach others to be happy well the first step is modeling like we, we talked about that a bunch on the podcast dad of the if you really want to teach other people to change you can't force someone into change i think i said this frank knight quote uh the other day that that there's no the rash there's no objective reason to do anything just like there's no objective reason to think anything it's all on the individual it's all relative to the individual 
And so I think that's such an important thing of, fi- you know, you find that path, like we said, uh, focusing there, but then yeah. realizing that it's yeah, all and, internal and, the fact and you that can't the matter drag is other like people along. When all we you can do don't is model, teach, and if you do a good again, job it's of modeling, a disservice you. because <laughs> you managed to create something for yourself that freed you and that made you happy. So sharing that will mm. perpetuate your joy as well because service to others is really in the end how we create a higher vibration for ourselves and others. So yeah, it's 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 diving into it, living it, and then sharing it as much as you can with as many people as will listen. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I, not, I used to I'm teach yoga at the Kennedy uh, Center in New York, and they, those are all uh, children with major PT, disabilities, PE, autism, PE, learning PE. disabilities, and the way that those kids were able to overcome certain things about themselves. And I didn't actually teach them yoga. I mm. teach them movement therapy through music. And like things that you wouldn't even imagine come out of that. Like, for example, one little boy would always just stand still and look down for two and a half years. Stand still, look down. Then one day he walked in looking at everyone, chest up, ready to go. And he did everything that we had asked him to do. So we learned that in his autism, he's a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. And unless he understands how to do something 100%, he doesn't feel confident. And he will look down and curl up until he feels like he can do it. And then he stands up straight. And he's like, look Mm -hmm. at me. I got this. So literally through something completely unrelated, you, you learned how that kid operates. That's insane. It's insane. And the same thing happens through yoga. Like you can really help people understand who they are just because what yoga does is it shows you the things that are always coming up, whether that's judgment for yourself, judgment for others, because you'll be on your mat. Oh, my God, I can't do this pose. Maybe I shouldn't come to yoga anymore. Or, oh, my God, look at that girl. Look how she can do it. I wonder what she's doing. I, you know, she, she probably just naturally that way. Right. You see the things that come up. And those things come up when you meet everyone in every scenario. But while you're doing yoga, you get to observe the thoughts and you get to notice them and why they're showing up and you get to question them. And questioning them is what helps you change them and start to implement different thoughts. So, I mean, it's all related, really, because us learning is the only way that anything will change. But you have to learn it yourself. You cannot try to teach someone else something that you haven't really learned yourself. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. Speaking of learning, thanks for that segue. I, I've learned a, a new standard answer to solving all problems. It used to be protect the golden egg. <laughs> Uh, that was what we used to talk about in rugby, you know, is protect the ball, right? That was that was the answer. And I asked the boys, well, what went wrong here? Well, we didn't protect nope. the ball. And, you know, it was it became a joke for, for many, many years. But now I get a new one. <laughs> the answer is yoga. Well, there we the, go. the physical yoga practice is of yoga solution, is only world. one of if eight everybody steps. Was and doing that, the downward that's where, like, a right lot now, of the confusion be comes in because we that's call meditation remember, meditation so. and we call <laughs> physical yoga yoga, but meditation is the seventh limb of yoga. So yeah. meditation is actually one of the higher steps of yoga, and it's what you aspire to do as you're doing physical yoga is to be able to create a meditative state. And that meditative state, as you mentioned, could be playing rugby. It could be walking. It could be cycling. It could be swimming. What makes it meditative is your ability to sit back in who you are and be an observer of the situation instead of being identified and being the subject of the situation. And you can get into that space doing a lot of different things, even if the physical practice of yoga is not one of them because if you're a paraplegic you can still do yoga because you can still breathe and you can still think so you can still do yoga Mm -hmm. yeah 
Camden, uh, so how about I, you? What did I'm you sure learn? I'm sure my spelling wasn't right on this, but uh, Joanna, you said uh, the word uh, samati, and I hadn't heard that before, but uh, it connected to the Stoic uh, the Stoic word of, or I guess a Latin word, but from Stoics, of uh, sympathia, of just the connection with everything. And I, so uh, that was just an interesting, I don't know, it's just like a vocab one. Oh, I love that. I learned more about rugby, that, and I would have never thought of rugby <laughs> as such a like deeply impacting right. sport. So I'm going to have to look into learn? it more because my roommate in college played rugby and she tried to convince me and I was like, hey, no, I would never do a sport like that. So I think I need to look into it a little more. And I, I think I may have missed out on something there. <laughs> To, to be honest, as as we were talking through, I was yeah, thinking I think about it, did. and <laughs> I I don't know. I think there's a lot that goes into it because rugby is a culture that builds in so many of those you know uh, ideas. But also, I think it goes back to our conversation around discomfort. Of rugby is intentionally putting yourself in a discomfortable position for a very long time, going and exactly. running up against another full grown man, full speed, and like it's like that. That discomfort creates, you know, the opportunity for growth, like we were saying. I love. I think it. that might be what it goes back to. Sorry to open up a rabbit hole that we're going to close immediately because we got to end the show. But <laughs> no, great, great philosophy, and, and you know, I'm always a fan of rugby. Well, I always love here. phone calls. Rugby so eight one five five zero one five zero seven zero. You can always text me, call me. You, uh, you can find you me at bay dash lifestyle dot com. Or on Instagram, it's Bay underscore Lifestyle PR. I do. Um, the biggest one is going to be our retreat in Bali. It's a yoga adventure Beautiful. retreat. Don't you have a couple we're going to go to a lot of different temples, next, uh, and we're going to go to a lot of beautiful beaches and meditate and do yoga and just experience such a rich culture. Um, I went there last year, and to be honest, I had no idea that my life would be impacted so mm. much by their culture. But the U.S. is such a young country. We don't have a lot of culture. So going into a space where it's a very ancient culture and they do so much to preserve it, it's just so incredibly beautiful. And I'm really excited to be able to share that with as many people as possible. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that, what an experience that'll be. Johanna, man, this, is, this has been an amazing <laughs> show. We really appreciate having, having you Mrs., uh, take Mrs. some time US out of your day before of the big celebration I can't even that believe dad it. is throwing on for you. Being, being the miss, miss, we'll just say miss, woman of a... It is. There we it go. Is. I know, that's an amazing Thank you so pile. much for that, having that me. Cool. You guys are amazing. Folks, it was an honor. Uh, Check out the pictures because that crown is something else. I tell you what. Thank, thank you again. Yes, ma'am. All right, Camden, thank you for listening to the Camden Otis Show, and a special thanks to our guest Joanna Godinez for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to pass it along to someone else so they can enjoy it too. Make sure to follow the Camden Otis Show on Facebook and Instagram, and you can watch full videos of the show on our YouTube page. While you're there, make sure you hit that subscribe button too. As always, the full archive of our episodes is available.